Absolutely, and it's interesting to see uh, the way in which uh, the G20 has emerged as a platform uh, for uh, the uh, strategic ties to also be discussed, to also be uh, uh, talked about in uh, the statements of the member countries. Uh, uh, just look at the way, uh, for example, the uh, India-US partnership has evolved uh, and looking at the way in which the bilateral meeting between the two leaders of the US and India uh, also uh, very prominently focused on defense ties and uh, uh, the G20 um, its transformation as a global platform to not just talk about economic challenges but to also talk about uh, issues like sustainability like climate change and also uh, defense related issues and why not uh, given the impact that the Russia Ukraine war has already had uh, and the way in which those uh, effects have cascaded and uh, impacted uh, most of the focus areas of the G20 platform and uh, uh, the issue of human centric development also finding uh, major prominence as far as uh, India's commitment uh, to um, making the voice of the Global South heard is concerned and uh, as we see the Indian Prime Minister welcoming those uh, G20 leaders uh, it's also important uh, to remember that uh, it's going to be uh, an action packed day with uh, the first session uh, starting off in just a short while from now, uh, One Earth, which will be focusing on the issue of climate change, followed by another session which was uh, focusing on the theme of One Family, uh, One Earth, One Family, One Future, Vasudev Kundubakam being uh, the uh, theme, uh, the mantra uh, for the G20 summit. Uh, uh, those live visuals coming in from uh, the G20 venue, Bharat Mandapam, the culture corridor, uh, which is hosting uh, the G20 summit and the expectations uh, that the summit brings along uh, when it it comes to uh, finding solutions to global challenges. Um, it's been a very difficult year for India's G20 presidency uh, coming at a time that it did. Uh, like you just mentioned, defense finding uh, a very important uh, uh, mention as far as the statements are concerned as well in the run-up to the G20 summit. Um, uh, the direct fallout that the Russia-Ukraine war has had uh, on uh, uh, the G20 priorities and also the issue of supply chain disruptions and finding alternatives uh, away from China. And this has been something that has been talked about uh, by India, not just uh, as it took over the G20 presidency, but before that as well. Because uh, let's face it, India and uh, most of the countries have realized the need uh, to find alternative supply chain routes uh, and the COVID-19 pandemic was a huge factor uh, as to uh, why uh, the countries have uh, also accelerated those efforts um, given the way in which uh, the pandemic uh, actually impacted uh, the supply chain uh, uh, supply chains as well. Thank you. Thanks, Molly, for all those updates. Stay with us. Uh, we're now just going to now move on to our guests for more on this. So we're joining, uh, we're being joined by Professor James D. J. Brown, who's joining us from Tokyo. He's an international affairs expert. Welcome to the broadcaster. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. James, uh, now the no-shows at the G20, of course, there has been enough talk about that. So I'm going to move forward from there. All these liberal leaders walking into Delhi, there is a lot of discussion. Uh, session one is about to start. Climate, of course, is on the agenda. Where do you see the G20 summit arriving at with the climate talks? Yes, unfortunately, it's going to be rather difficult. Uh, climate, uh, climate change, climate finance is precisely one of the issues that G20 should be focusing on, something that affects all of us uh, wherever we're based. Uh, there's ambition from uh, the hosts to have progress on this, ambition from others as well. But unfortunately, um, I'm not really expecting too much progress on this issue on this occasion. In particular, members such as Saudi Arabia, uh, to an extent China as well, are somewhat dragging their feet uh, on this issue. So I think that uh, some significant breakthrough is, is quite unlikely on climate issues. Now, what's uh, something that's related to climate is this uh, row, if you will, a, a reaction uh, to Fukushima's release. And you're very close to that, of course, uh, being in Tokyo. Uh, we just saw uh, Prime President Yoon across the stage. We've seen Prime Minister Kishida across the stage. Uh, and something that's related to climate, of course, is how this impacts the Pacific more broadly. I'm wondering if you see the G20 uh, taking a stand in any way, uh, even poking at the issue, uh, and how you see it from, from where you're sitting in Tokyo. Yeah, so for Prime Minister Kishida, 
uh, attending the G20, that will be absolutely top of his agenda. And the, the Japanese government is very keen to push back against what they see as the politicization of this issue. Uh, they believe that uh, they have the, the backing of the International Atomic Energy Agency for the release of this uh, treated water from the, the ruined Fukushima nuclear plants. And they feel that countries such as China and Russia, not for scientific reasons, but rather yeah. for political reasons, have used it as an excuse to criticize Japan. So I think that Prime Minister Kishida, in all of his meetings, will be looking to raise this issue mm -hmm. and to try and convince everyone that uh, Japanese seafood is absolutely safe. Yeah, it does give it a really an opportunity, though, to have a, a conversation about right. the, the ups and downs of nuclear energy, though, doesn't it? Exactly. But, and uh, Kishida has been going all out to ensure that, you know, yes. and to tell the world, and there have been some optics here as well, that, you know, <laughs> I'm having seafood uh, from uh, the Fukushima water, and, you know, it's all fine. Yes. So there is a bit of an attempt. And, I'm, I, you know, I think, uh, James, do you feel that it will kind of come to the fore when uh, Kishida speaks here and, uh, you know, kind of stance that Japan takes here at the G20 summit regarding how Fukushima is going to be fine for the climate? I, I think the, they might try and do it in uh, not such a public way. I don't think that the Japanese Prime Minister really wants people first and foremost to think about this issue when they think about Japan. So rather, I think it would right. be in bilateral meetings, a bit more kind of quietly one-on-one, -on -one, that it would be raised and uh, the Japanese leadership will try and get their message across. James, also, uh, you know, the member states will be, do you think the member states will be able to reach consensus on pertinent issues? And we, we have to bring this up again because it's already there in everyone's mind, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the war in Ukraine and China's growing assertiveness in the region, of course, from where you are at the moment. China is assertive in that region as well. Do you feel there is going to be a consensus that the nations will be able to arrive at together? I think it's uh, it's even more difficult than last year. Yeah. Last year, there was a huge amount of debate as to whether a joint communique would be able to be released, whether agreement on the key points such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine, whether they could agree language on that. It was just about managed last time. Unfortunately, I think this time it's even harder. And uh, especially with, with China really seeming to be seeking to undermine the G20 uh, with Without China's support, I think joint communique might be too difficult this year. India, James, India is set to become the voice of the global south. Now, uh, what mm -hmm. are your expectations from this summit? Now, of course, India has taken a major stance in terms of bringing the African Union in to the G20 summit. It is a definitely, it's a big move and it has been uh, not seen before. India is definitely taking this stance to bridge that gap between developed and developing nations. What do you see and what do you expect from this summit in that aspect? Yeah, I think it's a really important point that um, even if we don't end up with a joint communique, this will be a, a valuable meeting. The, the fact that agreement has been reached on the African Union becoming a permanent member, that's already something very important. And people around the world from developing countries will be watching this and it will convince them that the G20 is not just about the, the most kind of powerful, the richest countries, but actually is a force that serves the interests for uh, the, the global global south. Uh, but for them, for those countries, in addition to that membership, what will really matter is if anything can be agreed on food. And um, that's where the, the Ukraine uh, conflict is of greatest importance for those countries in the way that it's really disrupted uh, grain exports to, to poorer countries.